Hi, everybody. My name is Paolo Meninato. And today we're going to be going over my presentation, Beyond Raising Awareness. We're going to be talking about how to incite systemic change through art um, and the value that art can provide for social justice movements in the world today. Um, I have been engaging in postgraduate practice-led research at Plymouth College of Art for the past year. Um, that's basically fancy talk for saying that uh, my research focuses on um, creating art and applying concepts from readings that I've been reading um, uh, into my art. So basically, since I make political art, specifically, I've been working on creating art around animal ethics. Uh, my work has revolved around reading texts relating to animal rights activism um, and political organizing theory, as well as other um, readings, and then applying these ideas to my creative practice and figuring out what can I learn from this so that um, I can share this information with you and hopefully from here on out um, you can have more effective activism. Um, in terms of the, the format of the presentation slash workshop, um, you can feel free, free to speak up, um, but please keep your front points brief. Um, we do have fairly limited time, so let's try to stay on track. Um, I definitely recommend writing down what you want to say before you say it. Um, there will be several interactive, well, not several, there will be two interactive exercises that I'll ask you to participate in. Um, so there will be room for interaction um, in addition to being able to raise your hand. And yeah, um, so I want to start out now by telling you my story. This is me and my mom over here. I was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina and my mom is a choreographer. I grew up in her dance studio, so she was a very influential figure in my life. I always really saw the power of art um, and the importance of art um, and how to translate ideas through images, especially with my mom, she worked with moving images. Um, in 2001, the Argentine economy collapsed, so we moved to Philadelphia. This was for me um, a big wake up call. This gave me a, a very insightful awareness of how political issues actually affect real people. I think a lot of um, the movement doesn't really see how, um, like we see how the, the, the systems of oppression impact animals, but a lot of us don't personally feel it. Um, so for me, um, understanding what it's like to um, go through political struggle gives me a very different perspective um, on, on oppression than somebody that may not experience oppression in the same way. Um, in 2011, I was active in Occupy Wall Street. I've always been interested in political movements. However, Occupy Wall Street was my first real opportunity to engage with, um, with activism um, in the way that I wanted to. So I was very active. I went to every protest, every rally. I actually, I took, I went on a bus um, on the day before the Occupy Wall Street protest went viral, not even knowing where I was going. I just got on a bus and went to New York. Um, no idea where I was gonna stay or what I was gonna do. Um, and then I got to Occupy Wall Street and the very next day was literally the day that the protest went viral um, and it, that day changed my life. Um, I spent the whole next year protesting um, and going to as many actions as I could. I went to so many actions that uh, one day a reporter randomly decided to take a picture of me um, and that picture went uh, semi-viral um, and circulated in newspapers all over the world. That's the picture over there. Um, that was for May Day for 2012. Um, and I was pretty sad when this picture got so much coverage because I felt like I hadn't really accomplished anything. I wanted to change the world and clearly nothing had happened. Um, we did start a conversation with Occupy Wall Street, um, but that's all about all we managed to do. Um, we started a conversation and we started a network that then created social change um, on a local level, but that's all, about, all we managed to do because we weren't being strategic. We were just doing the same action over and over and over again. In terms of tactics, they're the most effective um, when they are innovative. So when we're first starting to do something, um, and sometimes when we're still figuring it out, when we're still tweaking it, um, that's when our actions actually yield results. Um, usually when we've been participating and doing the same thing 
for a while, um, that's when it stops being effective. So I think when it comes to social justice movements, we need to be really clever about evaluating what we're actually doing so that we can actually continue to be effective instead of just doing the same thing time after time after time um, and not really getting anywhere. So um, I decided to engage in what's called practice-led research. Research literally means um, the act of searching again. So re, doing again, and then search, we're searching again. Um, so what I do is I examine concepts on activism, political organizing, entrepreneurship, and art. I apply these concepts to my practice, um, and then I write about and present um, and talk about how these concepts apply not only to my creative practice, um, but also um, how these concepts can help social justice movements. So I'm critically evaluating the existing literature. Um, now I would like to point out um, that I did write um, an ebook that's available for free. I'm not gonna be able to cover all of the material, all of my research today, because unfortunately we don't just don't have time. Um, so this ebook gives you a nice overview. I am publishing an actual book. Um, in the future about my research. Um, but if you want to get um, more information, um, you can definitely sign up to receive my ebook. Um, and you can sign up for my e email list and you'll get my ebook. I am going to pass around my iPad and then you guys can, can sign up. Thank you. Um, okay. Now I want to talk about um, the importance of different roles within the movement. Um, this was one of the first bodies of work that I did. This was for my um, university thesis. Um, I did um, a series about the desaparecidos, who are a series of 30,000 people who disappeared during Argentina's military dictatorship. Um, the government targeted specifically uh, left-wing activists. Um, this is part of the Red Scare, where um, the government um, and the people in power were extremely afraid of um, communism and socialism. They were basically trying to get rid of socialists and get rid of communists. Um, and this is a really important historical period because it shows us who um, the people in power target when nobody is looking. Um, the whole operation to try to get rid of um, 30,000 people was entirely underground. Um, so they targeted activists, um, and one of the groups that they targeted were um, intellectuals. Um, this is um, fairly common knowledge, um, but Noam Chomsky in Who Rules the World has a really great essay about um, the importance of intellectuals and why the Argentine military dictatorship targeted this group of people. Um, I just want to show you some of the people um, that went missing. This is Carlos. Um, he is the son of Nora Cortinas. Uh, she's the co-founder of Madres de Plaza de Mayo. Um, they're a political group in Argentina of mothers who are fighting for, um, to find their missing children um, and to get justice for them. Um, because of uh, the work of Madres de Plaza de Mayo, as well as um, the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, um, the Argentine military dictatorship um, was one of the few atrocities where the perpetrators were actually prosecuted. However, there are still um, ongoing battles. Um, Carlos has never been, his body has never been found. Um, we know that he was um, taken by the Argentine military dictatorship, but we don't know exactly what happened to him. Um, this is Alice, her body was also never found. She was a French nun, um, and she was um, organizing, organizing with the Madres, um, and she was among a dozen other activists that were disappeared. Um, and yeah, again, her body has never been identified, and I think it's very telling um, that the military dictatorship was, they said that they were targeting radicals, um, and people who were dangerous, um, but why would they disappear a nun? Um, these are um, my dad, um, one of his friends. These are her parents. Um, she woke up one day and they were missing and they never saw them again. Oh, sorry. And yeah, um, so she woke up and her parents were missing. Um, her parents were intellectuals. They were university professors. And yeah, um, so I think it's really important um, to highlight what these people have gone through um, because as activists, we need to be aware of the power that we have um, because if the people in power could do everything that they wanted to, we would not be here today. Um, so 
intellectuals have a really powerful role in the movement. Um, we spread ideas. Ideas spread really quickly when we conceptualize of them. Um, so in terms of our power, you know, these ideas just kind of trickle down. This is a very hierarchical looking model, um, but I just wanted to give you an illustration of how uh, ideas can spread. Obviously, it's an oversimplification. Um, now I want to talk about the importance of political organizing because my idea is not just to, you know, do my own work on my own um, and then just kind of like leave it there. I want my ideas to spread um, and I also want people to understand the importance of being strategic and um, engaging in collective action in terms of political organizing. Basically what it means is to activate a constituency to protect participate in collective strategic action aimed at achieving a political out, a particular outcome. So when we're doing political organizing, um, we're working together. We're not trying to, you know, do, okay, I have this idea for this action and I'm just going to try to do it on my own, um, but we're engaging in a collective struggle and we're working together um, to achieve goals. Um, so we're not going to be able to achieve goals for the political movement on our own. We need to tap into existing structures and be really smart um, about what we're actually doing. Before we move forward, I know this first part of the presentation was scary. I want to give you a cute pictures of my animals and we're going to do our first exercise. Um, this is a chant from Occupy Wall Street. Um, it didn't say a vegan world is possible, it said another world is possible, but I think it's really empowering. Um, so I want all of us to, to say this chant. Um, I'll show you guys how it goes. And I think these types of chants are really important because it shows you how collectively we can accomplish a lot more um, than on our own. If we're just chanting this chant on our own, no one, hardly anyone will hear us. If we're all chanting together, you know, they might be able to hear us from down the street. Um, so let's see, do you guys want to see how loudly we can chant? Yeah. So this is how the chant goes. We're going to chant for a full minute. Um, it goes like this. We are unstoppable. A vegan world is possible. We are unstoppable. A vegan world is possible. We are unstoppable. A vegan world is possible. I can't hear you. Louder. Louder. We are unstoppable. A vegan world is possible. We are unstoppable. A vegan world is possible. Woo! All right, that's enough. All right, you guys did awesome. Woo! Did that feel empowering? Yes, okay, let's do more of that because a vegan world is possible. You know, we care so much about our animals and most people love animals. They're just not aware of what they're doing or if they're aware, they just don't know how to stop it. Change is um, a difficult process to engage in, but it's so possible um, to actually change the world. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, this is the spectrum of allies. This is how we get people um, to on our side. So on the far end of the spectrum, we have our leading opponents. Um, then we have active opponents, passive opponents, neutrals, passive allies, active allies, and activists. Um, so what we want to do is we want to shift people from one side of the spectrum to another. That is the main goal with my um, art and with my research as well. Um, so by activating empathy, we can neutralize opponents. Art is not very likely to um, provoke people um, that are our opponents into action. Um, it's also likely to win over neutrals um, and passive allies and get them to either go vegan um, or um, at least change their minds around issues related to animal ethics. What I'm also interested in is taking, like for example, vegans um, that may not feel comfortable doing political organizing um, and giving them the tools to say, you know what, there is this thing that I can do um, and making it easy and tangible for them to do that. Um, or to take people who are already activists um, and give them ideas that are going to take their work to the next level. Um, in terms of communicating with people, we want to just be aware of the fact that everyone has their own version of the truth um, and that we can communicate our own version of the truth and that it's not quite as hard as um, we may think it is. The vegan movement has focused primarily on um, conversations. However, I don't think conversations are actually the best way 
to, not, maybe not the best way, but I don't think they're our only strategy to get people to go vegan. I think we can go beyond the conversation um, and use images to create dialogues that are actually more powerful and more likely to be remembered. It's really difficult. Isn't it difficult to engage in conversations with non-vegans? Yeah, but with a picture, we can tell the whole story. Um, and, you know, we may not agree with what they're saying, or they may not agree with us, but the, the image stays in their mind much longer than the conversation. People normally forget um, what we say, but in terms of images, they stick around longer. I just want to point out, um, in terms of like how farmers see um, everything that is going on with the animals, how they see the vegan movement, how they see animal agriculture, they probably see this picture in a very different light than we do. Um, they see, I've talked to a lot of farmers about this, and they may say that, um, you know, these animals are fed twice a day, they're taken care of, they're protected from predators. Um, so they're seeing this image in a very different light than we are. Um, but if we turn the image around and do like what Joanne MacArthur does, um, where she takes um, an image from like a very specific viewpoint, we see a very, very different scenario where there's um, a baby taken away from its mother. So that is the power that images have, is we can show our perspective um, and this image is obviously a lot more powerful than just telling people to go vegan so that's that's really the goal with art um, is to create an environment where people are open to our message um, and um, ideally I think the easiest way to do that is through art in my opinion um, we can do it through conversation but art opens up a whole nother spectrum um, that is worthy of being explored. So now I wanna talk about why art is suited to dismantle systemic oppression. Um, first off, we have the picture superiority effect where pictures are much more powerful than words. Um, it's much easier to remember pictures. Um, the impact is like right away you see an image um, and you'll typically get what the image is about um, within a couple minutes or straight away. Um, so we don't have to engage in this conversation explaining our ideas, it's just there um, and people get it. Um, works of art um, are also have greater potential than just photographs, for example, um, to be simultaneously striking, although photographs can also do the same thing. Um, but works of art can be striking, memorable, challenging, and engaging. A lot of the photographs that you see with the Save Movement um, or with undercover footage, they're very difficult to engage with um, because of the graphic nature. However, once we add um, an element of uh, the painting, um, it becomes much easier. It softens the impact to get people to really look at the image. Um, I'll show you some examples in a minute. To get people to really look at the image without um, being turned off. Um, art can also leave room for interpretation. This is really important. When people connect the dots between ideas, they typically tend to remember um, the ideas better and see ideas as their own, as opposed to somebody else telling them what to do, which is why the Socratic method, which is basically getting people to connect the dots on their own um, or asking people questions um, so that they can um, understand concepts as opposed to just telling them, you know, oh, all these animals are getting killed. Um, that's usually a lot more powerful and better for moving people across the spectrum of allies than just giving them the facts. Typically when we give people facts, um, they tend to dismiss them. Um, there's a bunch of cognitive um, deceptions that people engage with, cognitive biases, that will prevent people from consuming new information that contradicts with their worldview. However, when it comes to art, um, it's a lot easier to get people to engage with it um, than conversation, in my opinion. And then in terms of painting, uh, we can emphasize process over the product. Um, this actually creates more space for inner innovation. Um, I think in terms of activism, this is something that we would really benefit from is more creativity in the movement because, um, again, tactics are the most effective when they are new. Um, so if we're emphasizing the process, we're gonna be able to create new things and create more um, innovation and create new ideas and create new ways of relating to other people. There's also the tactile quality of the image, which slows down um, how um, the image and the concept is actually read. Um, so when you have an image um, that has painting on it, you can't really see the, the brush strokes here well, 
but when you have an image um, that relies heavily on like the textural qualities, people want to stop and they want to look at it and they want to like look at the different parts of the image. Um, and you don't really get that from, um, from most photographs. Um, and yeah, and you definitely don't get it if you just have like your message of like go vegan right away. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't tell people, like have banners telling people to go vegan, but this is another strategy um, that can be really useful um, in getting people to engage with the work subconsciously um, as opposed to entirely on a conscious level because our conscious minds are not, are not nearly as rational as we think they are. Um, there have been uh, a bunch of new vegans in my master's program. Maybe not a bunch, but there's 40 people in my master's program. Um, about five of them went vegan. So um, usually when it comes to efforts relating to vegan outreach, um, it's usually about like one out of 100 people actually will stay vegan. Um, so this has the potential to be a lot more effective um, than traditional methods. We also have opportunities to explore ideas multiple times. Um, like for example, with this piece, um, this is the same concept as the one before it. Um, this is what a chicken looks like when they've been split open um, when they're an egg laying hen. So egg laying hens in the wild lay about 15 eggs a year. Um, and in factory farms, they lay 300. Um, so this is what their bodies look like from the inside. A lot of people don't really see this type of image. Um, and the original source image is very, very striking and really difficult to look at. Um, but by softening the image a little bit, um, I get people to engage with it. And then they start seeing um, how we eat eggs in a very, very different light. Um, this is um, called asphyxiation. This is about um, the baby male chicks that have been bred to produce eggs, but they were born male, so they are, I'm sure most of you are aware, um, they're killed as soon as they're born. Um, so what I did is I expressed this concept through um, glass. I cast glass and then um, created images on the glass that people, so people look through the glass. And um, in my master's program, people were telling me that um, when they saw these like little glass sculptures, they really wanted to look at them um, because it's like this really beautiful object. Um, but then they look inside and um, they see a very graphic image that's graphic, but doesn't really turn them away. They mentioned that they wanted to keep looking at them. Um, this is maybe a little bit more of um, a graphic image. So this is an image of slaughter. By um, using the tactile qualities of the material, I can simulate the violence without actually showing any graphic content. Um, so again, this is a powerful image that gets the point across um, and gets people to understand what's going on with the animals and see images that they may not otherwise actually want to look at, um, but actually engages them through the, the tactile qualities of the material. Um, this is another one. This is a chicken that held on so tightly um, that their feet were ripped off. Um, so I, yeah, um, it's basically exploring the same concept. You probably wouldn't want to look at that image otherwise, but because there's paint involved, um, it becomes easier to, to look at. Um, this is Lily, a chicken um, that was slaughtered for, um, somebody took their picture during a save. Um, this is another pig, um, again, by using unexpected material choices, so not what you would expect. Normally, with this type of image, you would expect to splatter red paint on it, but by putting pink paint on it um, and putting like brown strokes with a palette knife, you're actually getting um, a very different image that's unique and that draws people in um, and gets them to question um, and gets and provokes new questions and thoughts. Same thing with this image. This is just another exploration of the same idea. Um, and yeah, um, and then also I want to point out um, is what's really important is not just rendering the image, but how we're rendering it um, with this um, with this chicken. Um, I rendered the chicken with um, like a lot of love and care, and that's something that you wouldn't normally see um, when it comes to farm animals. So how we are um, showing people what is going on, how we're depicting the animals, is something that's really important. This one's a little bit more obvious, um, the kind of concept it is. It's two white dudes um, basically um, drinking breast from a cow, and the cow is like, stop. Um, so this piece was actually really well received. Um, I exhibited it at uh, Tate Modern, and um, when I was there, people were 
coming up to me, like basically the whole time, asking to take pictures with the painting. Like it, it was like all the tourists were coming over to take pictures with the painting. Um, I'm not sure if in terms of like ethics, how ethical that is, because you know this is a sexual and um, unconsensual sexual act that's being perpetrated on this animal. Um, and then tourists are coming over to take pictures. Um, so there is an interesting ethical question there that I need to work through. But I think it's important that people are at least engaging with the subject matter. Um, and hopefully that can, that can create um, lasting change. Um, I also want to point out um, the importance of curation as political organizing, because how we're displaying the work, how we're spreading our ideas is just as important um, as the work that we're creating. Um, by engaging with institutions, we can reach larger groups of people. So by having this work at Tate Modern, um, a lot of people end up seeing the work and engaging with it um, than if I just have the work in my studio or if I just post it on Instagram. Um, and then another major way um, to incite systemic change is to work with um, institutions um, where we have policymakers and people who make important decisions regarding what happens in institutions. This piece was displayed at the School District of Philadelphia during a show I curated in 2016. Um, this is a piece of um, a baby calf that was taken away from their mother and is in a veal farm and will never get to move, probably. And by displaying uh, Leo over here um, in, uh, in, within the school district of Philadelphia, um, we get to start a conversation with the people who are uh, you know, making decisions around what kids are eating for lunch um, and what their lunch menu should be. Um, and then this was at um, Philadelphia City Hall. So again, getting legislators to engage with the type of work. This is the same piece, another version of the piece that I made about the chickens um, and how they ovulate 300 times a year. Um, so this is Rosie, this is in my dad's office. So my dad hung up this piece in his office. He's not vegan. Most of the people who go into his office are not vegan, um, but people regularly come into his office and they have conversations about veganism um, and they get the ideas about vegan, they get the basic ideas about veganism without me having to like physically there, be there explaining everything. Um, so this is another way in which, um, you know, with a painting, uh, I'm creating like replicas of myself that can speak for me um, about veganism without me having to be there and I can reach more people by exhibiting the paintings in different ways. Um, so this is not uh, vegan art specifically, but it is political art. Um, I had an opening at the Embassy of Argentina where I, the works that I showed you guys earlier from of the Desaparecidos, um, I basically put people in, I basically, not I didn't put people, um, I had an exhibition about the Desaparecidos at the Embassy of Argentina and people who were complicit in this atrocity um, were forced to sit in a room um, during different cultural events where they were staring at the faces of people that um, were killed during an atrocity that they participated in. Um, so I think that's really important um, is to like understand the fact that like by having an approach that's subtle um, but also um, strategic, I can like infiltrate institutions and actually get um, my artwork in front of the people who are actually participating in these atrocities or have participated in the past. Um, this is another piece that was also at the Embassy of Argentina during the Bicentennial. This is America in 2050. Um, so this is what, uh, like America, you can see like a whole bunch of the continent is underwater. Um, I'm showing it from the perspective of a Latin American, which is why it's upside down, and yeah. And then um, this is from my master's thesis exhibition. Um, this is in progress, but I'm just showing you how to curate um, an exhibition. So basically what I did is I took the pieces, um, and first I had this type of layout, but um, I didn't feel like the drawings were really working. Um, so I uh, 
put paintings instead um, until it worked together and the whole thing flowed together in terms of curation. A lot of people will just stick up paintings on a wall, but that's actually not what we want to do. We want to make sure that the paintings actually work with the space so that we're not just creating um, works of art and just putting them somewhere, but actually being intentional and strategic about where we're placing the work. Um, this piece was um, a, like basically as you walk down the hallway, you could see another piece um, that's by, this is a work by Marcus Nodwell, another master's student. And yeah, um, and by placing the two pieces there, this is a piece about toxic masculinity, this is a piece about um, carnism, and we see the element of the gaze that goes from one painting to the next. So this is very intentional in the way that it's, the works were placed. Um, so they kind of work with each other instead of just creating works of, like installing works of art um, next to each other without really thinking about how they flow together. Um, so now I wanna go on to talking about supporting the arts. Um, so I did my master's program in the UK, so it's in pounds. Um, so artists in the UK make on average 10,000 pounds a year and I want to ask a question about whether we are replicating oppression by asking, asking artists to contribute to the movement um, without providing any financial assistance. I'm con as an artist, I'm constantly being asked and given like opportunities to do this and do that, but there's rarely any funding. Um, and for me to take advantage of a lot of like the really amazing opportunities that I'm being offered, um, I'm regularly sleeping at the bus station because I don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and yeah, I mean, 10,000 pounds a year is below the poverty line, so I think this is something that we need to think about as a movement. Um, a lot of the grants that are available for artists um, are uh, grants that are not by vegans, um, so it's a lot harder as a vegan artist to get grants. On top of that, um, a lot of the grants that are available for vegans don't really want to prioritize vegan art because they don't see the value in it, as opposed to, um, for example, engaging in direct action or talking to legislators directly. So I think I think that's something that, like, if we want to keep artists exploring this type of work, we need to come up with ways of supporting it. Um, and I think um, part of it is funding art, but also part of it is buying art. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people don't buy art, um, and they're mainly related to like stereotypes around um, buying art, and that you have to be like some rich patron to buy art, um, or that you need like to spend 2,000 uh, pounds on a piece, and that's actually not true. Um, a lot of art is fairly affordable. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of issues relating to education. Nobody teaches you in school, like, oh, this is how you buy art, this is how you invest in it. As an artist, I wasn't even taught how to sell art in art school. Um, so how, do I ex like, how would you expect other people to know um, how to purchase art? Um, so that can create a lot of anxiety um, around buying art. Um, and yeah, again, there's issues around affordability. So I'm not gonna tell people, like, you need to go out and buy um, art, um, but I do think it is, it's an important question to raise um, around why um, we don't value, like for example, I see vegans all the time going out and spending, I don't know, a hundred pounds to go out to dinner or whatever at like an expensive vegan restaurant and like they can afford that, but then it's like, oh, I can't afford art. Um, so that's, that's something to, to take into consideration. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the value um, of hanging art. It's a quote by Stephen Pressfield. How would you behave if you were the best in the world at what you do? Um, and if we want to be successful activists uh, that change the world, um, I think our, our living spaces are really important um, because they're a reflection on our mental space. Um, and um, I think that begs the question of how can you curate your living space in a way that encourages creativity um, and innovative thinking. A really great way to do that is through art. Um, you can hang up a painting um, or you can, and or you can do uh, one of the many things I did. I do hang up my own paintings at my house. Um, but you can do um, other exercises as well. Like for example, um, I made this dream board th around this time last year um, where I had pictures of myself um, putting my work up in um, a fancy gallery in London. And then after that, like a month after that, um, that's when um, I found out that I was gonna have my work at the Tate. Um, I also put up a picture of myself going on speaking engagements all over Europe. And now that's happening. So um, yeah, I think that 
having, being intentional about what we're putting in our personal spaces is really important um, in terms of um, setting ourselves up for success. And you know, having a work of art that inspires you every day is a really great way to do that. So I'm not telling you that you need to like go out um, and buy my art. Um, but um, if you've ever thought about like investing in a dream, not necessarily my dream, but any artist's dream, um, you can feel really good while you watch those artists succeed, succeed um, have like a daily source of inspiration, um, and as well as another way of spreading the vegan message. Um, and now I wanna talk about the next project that I am starting, which is called Beyond Raising Awareness. Um, I wanna take the research that I've been doing um, and use that to start a social enterprise. Um, and I'm interested in the social enterprise model, so I don't have to like continuously apply to, for grants. Um, I wanna make money primarily through book sales. I am publishing a book, as I've mentioned earlier, called Beyond Raising Awareness, um, about how to do political organizing. Book sales, art sales, print sales, other services. Um, this business model is, uh, fortunately for me, highly scalable. Um, and I want to grow um, by engaging with existing networks using strategies that are already out there. For example, search engine optimization to drive traffic um, to a YouTube channel that I will be starting, also called Beyond Raising Awareness. Um, a blog, um, as well as using social media um, and mainstream media to spread ideas. Um, as well as doing presentations and conferences um, and partnering with existing organizations and nonprofits. The purpose of Beyond Raising Awareness is to educate activists so that they can achieve systemic change through creative action and political organizing. Um, and it's based on my practice slide research and experience. Um, and yeah, so I'm starting this thing. I'm gonna need around 20K to be able to do it full time um, while I do my art. Um, and if I want to scale it, um, when I scale it, I'm going to need to raise 100,000 to do that. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I will do it. And then, um, yeah, and then my goals are outsourcing labors to community organizers, give people really awesome jobs um, that uh, pay them well and that they believe in, um, as well as funding projects for social justice, including independent artists um, and art research, as well as training, providing training materials to hundreds of thousands of activists, not just vegans, but like among all social justice movements. Um, so that's what I want to do. If you want to support my work, I'll, in a minute, I'll give people time to um, ask questions. But um, if you want to support my work, you can follow me on social media. You can sign up for my email list, um, which I already passed around with my iPad. Um, you can think about investing in or original art and commissions. Um, or if you can't afford it, um, or you just want a print, um, you can purchase a print from my Etsy. Um, you can donate to my Patreon if you want to do something that's like monthly recurring. Um, you can book public speaking engagements. Um, connecting me with funders would be really helpful to start Beyond Racing Awareness as a social enterprise. And then um, if you're interested, uh, we can talk about volunteering. And you can also share this talk. And finally, I want to show you guys Otter. Uh, he's hanging up at the Greasy Vegan. Um, and he's one of my awesome dogs that I was commissioned to paint. So yeah, if you want to commission, it's definitely something that you're probably gonna love for the rest of your life because people love their pets and they don't stick around forever. Um, so it's great to have them forever in a portrait. A um, little bit less creepy than like the thing that you do where they like stuff up the animal afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, um, and that's my contact information. Now I wanna open it up for questions and discussion. Um, I'm not sure what people want to say. Um, if you guys want, we can do another exercise that I skipped where we go over, look at some of the art, and you guys can talk to each other about what you think about the work. So, yeah. I'll, le I'll leave that open. <laughs>